Are you ready to say goodbye to the constant ups and downs of the artist income roller coaster? Whether you're a full-time artist who wants to increase and stabilize your income, a part-time musician who wants to go full-time, or a hobbyist who needs to fund your passion projects, this podcast will equip you with the tools, resources, and inspiration to make it happen. My name is Bree Noble. I'm a musician, best-selling author, and educator whose mission is to help musicians like you to increase the income you're already making and tap into new income streams so you can create a more diverse, stable, reliable income from music and finally ditch the starving artist mentality. Now let's dive into The Profitable Musician Show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the podcast. My name is Bree Noble. I am so happy to be here today with Travis Huseman from Catamount Recording. We're going to be talking about some interesting stuff that we've really never covered on here, especially how to get hired as a studio musician. Travis has obviously a a recording company, a studio, and so he deals with hundreds of musicians all the time. And so he's able to really see, you know, what what qualities can help musicians get hired as studio musicians, how we can kind of supplement our income with that. If you're a performing artist that wants another stream of income, we'll also get into talking about how to make songs better in the studio and um, make them more, you know, uh, commercially viable and things like that and whatever else we talk about. So I'm excited uh, to get into this today. Travis, I'd love to have you share your background. What is your music journey story? How did you get into music? How did you end up starting a a studio recording company? Well, so um, I started like as a producer and engineer, like any other musician probably does, is when I was Growing up, I played guitar, played piano, um, get to junior high, high school, I start playing in bands, and like every other musician, I want to then go out and play shows, right, play gigs. Well, to get a gig anytime, you need at least some sort of demo of your band to play out there, so then I started, you know, trying to figure out that side of how to record something, and that interest took way over, and I ended up going to uh tech school for two years to kind of figure out how that happens and works and about the time i was done with that i met tom uh, tom tapman who he had been in the he is a music producer been in the industry for 30 some years at that point and uh you know grammy nominations and all that fun stuff a lot of rock bands and he was looking for someone to help him and after a few interviews and a couple like showing like yeah I guess I know somewhat what I'm talking about he took me under his wing and that was 2004 and I he was my mentor for a long time and that kind of just expanded and um, as he started slowing down I started getting more of his clients and you know that kind of just kept going into what it is now um, over time. Now how what made you think that you know like you're at a, you're at a point where it's like, I need to record an album. You can either raise money to go to a studio to record it, or you can say to yourself, well, I could figure this out. What made you think you could figure it out or you wanted to figure it out? (laughs) Because a lot of musicians don't. Yeah. For me, I mean, that point I was 17 years old, you know, so that, uh, that wasn't even about making an album. That was just, I wanted to play some shows at the local places, but they wouldn't even respond to me without some sort of like demo mm. for my band. So it's like, I just need something <laughs> that I can uh, play. You could set the bar kind of low because it was a demo and, and kind of uh, look in practice. I know what you mean because I did the yeah, same thing. My mindset completely is different at 17 than it is now at almost 40 years old. So it's like a little different, you know, <laughs> but, um, but still that's just what got the switch turned on. And as soon as I got into that, I was like, well, this is, um, this is pretty fun. I like it. And that, that interest took, took way over. A lot of musicians that watch and listen to the show, they are dabbling um, because they want to save money. Uh, yeah. You know, they want to have a home studio and that kind of thing. Did you start with the home studio and then expand into your own building or do you, are you still in a home studio? No, no. So um, Catamount is, it's a two, two studio facility. Um, SSL room, big live room. It's it's a 
pretty big studios. But when I started, yeah, I would, you know, scour eBay for every little piece of gear I could find and would buy stuff and buy and sell it and find stuff I like and didn't like. But like I said, once, once I started working under Tom and he showed me like you know, how things are really done, like it just, uh, opened my mind really to what I should be using and not, not getting stuff just cause I read it was a good thing to have, like actually use it and see what works for you and, and cut, cut, you know, continue on that path. So right, right now, this is, it's a two room studio facility with, so it's not, not a home thing to <laughs> say. So, however, I do end up mixing a lot of things that people attract at home mm -hmm. or, or talking with clients, just kind of figuring out their budget and figuring out what their goals are. If, um, if it's not going to be feasible for them to spend a bunch of time in here, then we'll try to knock out what I think anyway are, are like the most important things to do in a big studio, which to me are good drum sounds. To, I mean, I would say everything, but that would be the first thing. If you're doing like stringed instruments, like a uh, solo piano or grand piano or uh, violins, stuff like that. I prefer having it in a big room. You can usually get a better sound instead of like having the mic right on it in, in your bedroom type thing. It gets mm -hmm. pretty direct and not uh, like luscious sounding, you know. Um, and then obviously the mix. Um, those those are the, the things If I was talking with the client first, like, okay, if we can't, if we don't have the budget to do it all here and you already have a home studio since so many musicians do have at least something anymore, um, at their house to record something with and we'll we'll start with okay let's we'll do this stuff here then we'll transfer it to you and you can work on it and you know update me every week or so with what's happening and we'll we'll tweak it and stuff and then we'll just keep going so there i mean it's endless like how how i could end up working with a client either all here or they do it all at home and send me rough cuts along the way if i have any feedback for them and then i'll mix it so can be the options are endless really got it and and i imagine that if they're recording you know electric guitar or a keyboard or whatever you know that's a digital signal usually and so that would be much easier to just have a good solid sound from a home studio how do you feel about vocals vocals i would always prefer um them done done here just because i'll be here with them and mm -hmm. help, help them go through the track uh it, with anything, like even when I was recording my own songs years ago, I would still have someone else do it for me because it's two like two different mindsets. Mm. Like when performing, I don't want to think about like, okay, is this actually recording? Was there a glitch? Uh, how am I, how am I storing all these takes? How am I organizing all this so I can go through it later? Like I'd rather shut off that side of my brain and just focus on the performance part. So when I have a musician and I. I'd rather have them be doing that too. Just there and there worrying about singing and performing and, and getting the perfect take and everything else is taken care of, which I usually think then they get a better performance and uh, the song ends up better because, you know, it just snowball. <laughs> no, very true. I mean, they can focus on being a performer. Right. I, I know. know I record demos from home and I know exactly what you mean. You know, when you're on your 15th take and you're, you know, you're just being so critical of yourself, you just keep re-recording it. And Oh yeah. You know, <laughs> or just another like trusted ear to be like, yeah, no, that is good. You're, you're inside your own head. That's, that's good. <laughs> you know um, that. And, and to me, vocals, no matter what anyone says, vocals are the most important thing in a song. So they really, you know, and they should get, a lot of detail to them, hopefully. I agree. So do you find that you're operating also as a producer? Oh, and yeah. is that like an extra thing that you do for them? Do some of them actually bring in producers? Um, sometimes, but most of the time I'll act as a producer anymore. Um, but, but you know, I have done sessions where I'm just doing the engineering and they'll bring in an outside producer, sure. So let's talk about, um, as I mentioned at the beginning, talking about, you know, another stream of income for musicians. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's an opportunity for, you know, everybody that's recording something usually needs help. You know, they might need a backup vocal. They might need a, yep. you know, a guitarist or whatever. Sure. And what, you know, how can 
people get started with that, get connected, you know, how can they connect with studios and artists in their local area and then also online? Yeah. Um, well, I'll tell you kind of how I do it. Uh, so I, I work with a lot of like singer songwriter artists where I'm putting a whole band behind them quite often, actually. Um, so I have a handful of really good studio players that I'll bring in a lot of times, but however, I also get emails or calls almost weekly of musicians. Like they want to be a studio musician or, you know, just offering their services. And so, I mean, it is really hard to open that door mostly because I'm already so familiar with the people that I use a lot of times. And what I always tell um, musicians that when I talk to them then is um, when you want to be a studio mu musician, it's kind of a, a granted like that a producer or engineer to a producer or engineer that you're going to be a really good player anyways, like that it's kind of the obvious like okay yeah if they're gonna bring you in yeah, you'll definitely be good player but that's not even like the criteria that i have uh musician meet when i want you know to start hiring them <laughs> number one is are they even an okay person to be around for eight 16 you know however many hours it's going to take to do this session i'm going to have to be in there with them the whole time i don't want like a, a Debbie Downer the whole time, <laughs> you know, I want someone that's fun to be with her at least, uh, you know, I enjoy my time with them because I'm the one bringing them in. I, I'm going to want spend the time with them. So if, if they come in when I first meet them and they're kind of moping around or um, maybe very introverted, which a lot of musicians also tend to be, that's probably just not going to work out for me because, you know, the sessions won't go as smoothly if, we're not having a good time with it. And that, you know, that is always my end goal is to make the session be as smooth running as possible and get the best takes there are. So if there's going to be any hiccups in that, I just ignore it <laughs> right away. So that's like my number one criteria. Um, number two, which also gets very tough for musicians is um, if they're getting hired to play on someone else's song, I don't necessarily want them T trying to take over the session if you and, and tell the artist like well if this was my song this is what i would do or i would make make it like this because that's really not what the artist or i want um we'd rather them come in and play what the artist is hearing in their head of like how they imagined it the whole time now granted if if i or the artist like asked like i don't know like what like a drummer for instance like how what kind of feel would you put there then sure bring it up but i wouldn't like start taking over the session with all these ideas of, oh, you should, you should add a whole string part to this section or stuff like that. That, <clears throat> that kind of oversteps the boundaries a little bit and steps on the producer's toes and, and really goes down roads that uh, take too much time out of a, <laughs> out of a mm. session. Time is money. <laughs> yeah. And, and also it, um, it, it makes it difficult on the artist too, because now they had all these, you know, ideas what they thought it should be. And now they're second guessing themselves and just everything isn't going to go smooth anymore that way. So and that's my number two cri criteria for session players. And that, I mean, it sounds easy, but it's very difficult for music for musicians. And that has ended a lot of relationships with me with musicians or studio ones, because I can't like call them back after, you know, something like that in my mind anyways. Um, and then number three is, will you actually show up on time? Which should also seem like a no brainer, <laughs> but you'd be surprised. Um, Cause if I'm personally hiring them and putting, you know, my name on the line for them and I say, okay, we're starting at 10 AM and they're not here till 11, then, and the artist is here, then I'm there kind of looking like a clown you know like um <laughs> no i promise they're good they're good they just uh you know i don't want to start making excuses like that so those first three things like if if you can't meet all those three criteria, to me you can't be a studio music musician even if you're the best player in the world <laughs> in the world um and they all seem like easy things but 
you'd be surprised over the years how, how many people can actually meet all three of those criteria. So yeah, the, I mean, that's the main thing I follow. The other thing is how to actually get your foot in the door then and get hired as a musician, I guess, is what you were kind of wondering. I'm pretty sure all of my musicians that I've hired have either come about two ways. Um, number one, they were in a group that I probably already recorded at some point in my life. So it's kind of like a test anyway. So I've, mm -hmm. I've worked with them and I've, I've found out how they, you know, how they handle sessions. Are they easy to work with when they were here? Were they showing up on time? Were they a team player type thing? So then, yeah. And yeah, if they're good, then sure. I'll give them calls to play on stuff. The other is I've had um, interns many times at the studio and over the years, you know, I've, when I have an intern come in, um, I usually, there's a university in town. So I usually get one in fall and then in the spring, I'll get another intern a lot of times. And a lot of them are always music majors or something like that. So they're, they're very good players at what they do too. And if I'm hanging around with them and I basically I'll, it's a, a test without knowing it's a test type thing. Are they this, are they that, you know, um, then I'll give them calls to get paid on things outside of, you know, their, their interning duties, if you say. Um, so, I mean, those are really the only two ways I've hired people in the past is if I've already have some sort of relationship with them. Um, and I've kind of tested them, tested them in a way that's not on the clock, I guess you would say, um, to see how they would be before I put them in an environment where I'm paying them with clients they're sitting and watching with, you know, my reputation on the line. Yeah, those seem like, you know, they're pretty similar to other ways that people get other jobs, you know? Yeah, you, you yeah just, I, I say that to people all the time, but it's like, this is the only occupation I know and I've done it since I was 18 and I haven't done anything else. So it's like, well, yeah, I suppose it is obvious for everyone else in the world, but. I mean, it is, but it isn't. I think, I think musicians don't think about studio work the same way they think about you know getting a job anywhere else i mean really the best i mean it's almost even like marketing right you just you need to give people a little sample a little a little free taste Absolutely. of what you're like and what they would get if they actually were to pay you um Absolutely. you know just like we give out you know whatever a free checklist or a free income guide or you know people go oh, wow this is really good stuff i'd like to maybe buy some stuff from you same kind sure. of thing but Absolutely. you know applied to people absolutely and it's not to say that people that are cold calling me that want to be a studio drummer are wouldn't meet all those criteria it's just that i already have people kind of above them on my list right now that i that are tried and true that i'll continue to you know i'll call them first type thing so if you know if you were a musician looking to get it and i would before just starting to go out there asking <laughs> to be a studio musician i would you know, build a relationship with the producers and engineers around, get to know them and show them like what kind of person you are first, then you'll probably get more doors open. Yeah. So, but I mean, then that involves either being an intern, which could be really educational and fun and all of that, or using your studio or coming in with another group that's using the studio in order to get kind of that, that face-to-face yeah. -face time. Yeah. I mean, that's, how it's worked with the studio musicians I hire, but that's not to say that you couldn't um, just start hanging out somehow or, or meeting the producers um, and, and talking to them just on a, a friendship type base, you know, basis, you know, and meet them um, and, and let them know that way, as opposed to just being like, I'm a drummer. I'll play for you anytime. <laughs> um, that probably won't work as well. Do you find that there are like specific skills that you're looking for, for specific genres? Like should, should people market themselves? Like I know for myself as a vocalist, I specifically, when I'm promoting myself online for doing demos, I say like, I do Christian music. I do Broadway and classical because those are things that like the average person can't do. I also sure. can do pop, you know, right. but like, yep. is there a way to kind of put yourself forward as like, I'm really good in these particular genres i would yeah um and actually that is 
why I have so many different studio musicians is because they're all really good at something. Um, so like drummers, for instance, I have a really good rock type drummer where he, I mean, he smacks the snare drum very good. And then I have another drummer that he's just more feel and uh, like brushy type sound, you know, and same with um, singers. I have a lot of different singers on, on, you know, roll call, we'll say. And it's just because they have a different sound or different tone to their voice uh, who I think will probably match up because a lot of the singers I'm hiring are background singers, you know, so a lot of them who will match up good with the, the lead singer of the, of the song we're working on. So yeah, I would definitely market towards your strengths for sure. Um, especially if there's something that maybe is not as common. Oh, so I was wondering about backup singers. Do you find that you hire those a lot? A lot of artists sing their own backups or they have yep. band members that do it. Do you find yep. you have a need for those? Yeah, I hire them a lot. <laughs> okay that's good yep. to know yeah a um, couple of reasons number so singer songwriters if i'm putting the whole band behind them a lot of times lead singers aren't the best harmony singers mm. <laughs> um they'll always go towards the melody instead of the harmony a lot um so i'll i'll bring in harmony singers that it's just going to be way more efficient for them to sing the background instead of a struggle and have mm. the singer frustrated and stuff like that however a lot of times that also depends on the budget too. If, if, uh, if the band doesn't want to hire two or three singers for a couple of days, then, then we'll have them sing it and I'll usually come up with the parts for them and then they'll basically double the part. So I take the lead vocal out of their headphones. So they're not ever getting confused and use double the melody that you hear there. And that will be your harmony. Um, but, uh, what was I going to say about background singers, um, Oh, I, why I like to use them a lot is because it's a, if you use a different background singer as opposed to yourself, it always sounds bigger. Mm -hmm. So there's a, a better blend, you know, um, to me. Um, same like if you're recording guitars, if you've recorded a left and a right on a guitar, but there's the same amp and the same type of guitar on the left and the same type and the same amp on the right, it wouldn't sound as big or as wide as if you switched it up just a little bit you know use a little bit different tone um it'll, all, it'll always sound bigger to me um so that's why i like to use background vocals it'll, it'll make the whole thing sound nicer interesting i mean it's an artistic choice too like you think about someone like <laughs> phil collins or somebody that does all their own uh, backup vocals and that's a absolutely. specific sound right oh absolutely absolutely <laughs> um yeah. but as as i produce a lot of albums that's a sound I like. So I'll tend to lean on it. <laughs> right. Unless I have a vocal genius. That's a lead singer that, you know, something like you're describing there where they're going to want to do four part harmonies everywhere. <laughs> and then, okay, <laughs> you do your thing. Um, so let's talk about the production side. So what do you do to help artists just, you know, they come in with like this raw idea um, or, you know, just a basic demo or whatever. Yep. And you've worked with so many artists, you kind of have this sense of like, what's going to make it more commercial, what's going to make it more appealing on a, sure. you know, a, a pop level or whatever. And how do you convey that to the artist? And like, what, what shape are their songs usually in when they get there? Um, well, that varies big time. Mm. Uh, However, I always start with a pre-production meeting um, when I meet them and it's I'll tell them to bring in the versions of the songs, whatever. I mean, it could be just a very bad like phone recording for all I care. I just want to hear, mm. hear, hear where it is at this point somewhat. And then we'll, I'll pretty much start with just talking about their goals of like what their actual hope is for this song or this album type thing what are they trying to get out of it? Cause surprisingly, you know, bands are, can be pretty different. Some can be, they just want better paying shows and some can be, well, they want to have a million streams, you know, that are yeah. anywhere in between. So I really try to start catering the production then to what their actual goal is and help them. You know, my, my goal is as a producer always is not to, take over their song and make it my own it's really to help them get to their end line of okay this is this is my song and this is how i hear it in my head and this is what i want to do with it i want someone to help me 
take it there. Um, mm-hmm. And so I'll always offer advice along the way of, okay, in my experience or my opinion, this will make your song more catchy or more mainstream that more people will like it. However, at the end of the day, it's your song. So if you don't want to do it, we're not going to, not going to do it type thing. You know, at the end of the day, it's their name on the front, my name and very little marks on the back. So um, they were way more important than I. So yeah, we'll, we'll talk about the goals first and then, um, you know, figure out how I can actually help them achieve that with their song. And if, if it is something that they just want to make a song that um, will resonate with more people and they're having troubles with that, then yeah, I'll, we'll go through their song and I like to call it cutting out the fat, um, go through and see what's just not needed in the song first. And that will probably make it a lot better to start with. And then seeing where we can start adding the ear candy, as I call it, um, to make it more appealing to a larger audience, hopefully. But like I said, those are all just ideas and opinions that, you know, with a lot of experience over the years that I can offer to the, the musicians. However, if they're not on board with it, then we we don't do it. You know, it's it's not my song. And that ear candy, is that usually in the form of like, vocal hooks instrumental hooks like how, how do you help them yeah. figure out what that would be all of the above um it kind of depends on the band uh, if it's uh if it's a whole band already or if it's a single musician i just start within the band a lot and see like what are their strengths you know the song's going and let's say we get to verse two and nothing's really changed from verse two to verse one mm-hmm. um, which happens you know a lot um then we'll say okay what what can we change or add here that will make it more uh, interesting for the listener um, to keep the keep the short attention span of all (laughs) these people out there interested for another 30 seconds for another 30 seconds where they're actually listening to your whole song so i'll you know look within the band okay well uh, let's say if the band has a really good uh background singer then sure let's let's add some harmony stuff here here and there and, and touch it up or if they have a really good uh, creative keyboard synth player let's come up with some ideas with instrumental like call and responses or stuff like that just to keep it interesting but yeah I'll always start within the band and say and in my mind I would put something here do you guys have any ideas and then we'll you know talk it through like a team are you ever actually changing the writing I remember I mean I had a producer in the studio but I remember actually going and being like no like this line's not working or this bridge needs to be cut in half because it's too long you know, and we waited until getting to the studio to do those things, which was weird to me, but I know that that happens. Yeah, not so much changing. Um, like, I'm not going to change their chord structure or anything like that. That, I mean, that's the basis of their song. Mm-hmm. Uh, arrangement wise, I will, if I think there's spots that are you know treading water, as I call it, the song's not going anywhere. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's still, I will only offer the suggestion. I'm not going to say well i won't work with you if you don't cut out that bridge you know <laughs> uh, it'll be like I, i'll tell them i think this bridge should be cut or cut in half or something you know um to make the song better and then we'll talk about it and if, <laughs> if we're all on the same page then we'll do so um if not it's their song or i'm not going to to change it on them um but with like lyrics on the other hand so i like i try to get all this stuff out of the way before the band comes in so we'll have pre-production meetings or they'll send me even you know phone demos of the version of this so when they come into the studio it will go smoother and we're not sitting around talking about whether there should be 10 syllables in the second line of the second <laughs> whether there should be eight type thing let's get all that out of the way so when you're in there in the actual studio you're just performing and it's out I'm always big about like what it sounds like to the musician at the, at the time they're doing it. If it sounds better, they'll perform better. You'll get a better take. You'll get a better song. You'll get a better result. You know, it's a giant snowball of betterness. And uh, so if we can, if we start from day one with a pre-production where we're ironing out the song before they ever come in, everything will go better. <laughs> yeah, um, that makes sense. Do Do you, you think it's just your years of experience like when you hear a phone demo can you actually like 
hear it in your head, like fully produced or ideas or ways of arranging it that, cause I don't, I'm yeah. not like that. I listen to a phone demo and I go, Hmm, <laughs> you know, yeah, for the most part. And I mean, I, I'm a big, like a uh, note taker and uh, spreadsheets and all this. So I have, I mean, spreadsheets and documents upon documents of things that I've done in the past that I like all that. I'll always resort to things I know have worked and I'll, or if I hear a song that's uh, similar to, uh, or arrangement or structure similar to something I've done type thing, then I'll kind of refer like, oh, I'll look, okay, I did this once and that really worked or this type of client did this and that really worked. But yeah, that definitely came from experience of just logging what worked and what didn't work. And I write it down so I don't forget. <laughs> yep. That's good. <laughs> Do you have any other recommendations for artists of ways that they can save money in the studio as far as like, you know, yeah. just being really efficient with their time? Oh, yeah. Be prepared, first of all. <laughs> other thing, it depends what you want from the studio. If you're going to a studio, if you're going to go that route and go to a studio, then it's really a relationship with a producer. If, you know, if you're actually going to go the route of going to a studio, then I would get you know, I have a producer there. Hopefully they have a producer on staff, maybe even that can, or an engineer that can work also kind of as a you know producer helping out. Um, and just build that relationship where it's not, granted, there always has to be a first session where everyone's kind of tiptoeing around and feeling out each other and um, just seeing how people respond to stuff. But the more you can prepare for that ahead of time, the better. So I would talk with the, the producer before you ever even go to the studio. And like I was saying, work out a lot of those details because um, that's stuff that artists can be doing at, at home. They, they don't have to sit in the studio with me for a whole day of working out arrangements. They can work out arrangements, send it to me, and I'll you know spend 15 minutes on it, going through it and send them feedback back and then they can keep <laughs> working on it. So when they actually get in here, we're not wasting it bunch of time um the other thing just like technical stuff uh drummers make sure you get new heads on your drums ahead of time um get them somewhat tuned up before you come in because that will waste a ton of time um guitar players bass players um get them bring them to the guitar shop get them set up ahead of time Otherwise, you're going to be running into intonation problems, most likely. Mm -hmm. Broken um, strings, yeah. <laughs> all that stuff takes, you know, takes time out. And as soon as a, as soon as a, there's a hiccup in the recording session where we're waiting on something, then it just takes longer to get going again. Once you get in that flow, everything seems to always be running nice. And if, if you run into any, like, technical hiccups like that, then it uh, can be a problem. Um, so being prepared, really have your songs as ironed out as possible before you ever get in there. And hopefully that means talking with the producer ahead of time and, and working out ideas where you don't have to do it on, on your dime, you know, sitting in there doing it and then make sure your gear is ready to go. And if it's not, see if the studio has something they can lend you just, you know, stuff like that, that is going to save tons of time. And, and really like talking about the time, this is me personally. I know there's a lot of studios that aren't like that, but uh, I would talk with them and try to get your best quote ahead of time uh, for the musician. So you're not going over ever where they're going to start charging you more or something, because that's just going to stress you out. And that's going to make the whole thing worse if you're stressed out about it. So what I'll do a lot of times is I'll talk with the artist and, you know, at this point in my career, I know how long, things take so we'll talk about what they want we'll talk about their budget and then we'll agree to a number and then that's that I don't I don't even worry about the clock after that I'd rather artists not staring I don't even have a clock in this room actually so there's not not a time ever where the artist would be like oh I wish I could do another take but I don't want to pay for another hour mm. type thing that that just goes back to my whole theory of if they're <laughs> worrying about other things are not performing well so i would rather just we'll have the pre-production meeting we'll get all that budget stuff out of the way and then you know what it's going to cost and then we just go make make it happen 
we don't worry about the clock anymore. So how do you handle that if artists are, you know, you think you've got everything all dialed in and for a price, but uh -huh. then they come and they start like doing things in the studio that are changing and taking a lot of time and not really, you know, living up to the agreement. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> shockingly that doesn't happen as often as you would think it would that's uh, good but like i said i kind of know how long things take even worst case scenario how long mm. things take in the studio so it's kind of all budgeted in and thought about to start with and and really i mean this probably just comes with experience doing over time but when i meet with someone in the pre-production meeting and i you know there's questions i'll ask them i can kind of get the feeling of like uh, what kind of person they are if they're very uh, back and forth type where they might switch their mind quite often where <laughs> I could foresee down the road I'm going to give them a finished mix and then a month later they're going to want it completely different type thing and, and that's probably just experience but that to me it, it, I'd rather you know risk that little bit for how little it actually happens to make the artist feel more comfortable in the studio and not have to like be worrying about the clock. I wondered but, about the mix. Do you allow the artist to sit in on the mixing process or do you produce a mix and then get their feedback? Cause I remember being in the studio with a band and they were like getting super granular during the mixing process and arguing about, and I'm like, how much more are we being charged for this? <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, so if it's something I've been on, working with the band from day one um, and producing the, the whole project by the time it gets to the mix point, I should really know what they're going, what they're wanting and going for. And I'll always prefer to mix alone. It's way more efficient. Mm -hmm, for sure. Like I'll get it to where I think it sounds best and should be. And if, like I said, if I've been working with the client the whole time, I should know what they're going for at that point. And so I'll get it to where I think it's good. And then I'll have the, the, the band come in and listen to it in the studio if possible if they're if they're around that they can do that i'll have them come in and listen because then we can just tweak on the fly and usually at that point they're going to be pretty small things um and it's much easier if they're here next to me instead of going back and forth emails in here and there um to just like oh okay i'll turn the vocal up a little bit um, that would be ideal However, if it's mixing, if I'm mixing something for someone that like recorded the whole thing at home, then mm. I'll ask them a lot of times um, before I even start the mix, like, okay, what were you going for? Um, in your mind, give me like two or three albums that you think are like the greatest sounding albums. Mm. Ever. If yours would sound anything like that, you'd be happy type thing. Just so I have some point of reference, like, okay, they like this type of sound or like they like this type of sound gives me a, a direction to at least head Which of course it has to be realistic if they're recording from home and they're like my favorite album is hysteria or something it's like <laughs> that's not gonna sound like that yeah, it has to be realistic and <laughs> um if it's not i'll i'll tell them like okay well your uh your vocals and everything did not sound anything like this so if that is the point if that's really what you want to go after maybe you should pre-track some things otherwise we'll get it as close as we can to that but yeah we, def we definitely have to be realistic <laughs> well i want i want to kind of close us out with a bringing us back to the studio musician idea yeah. um yeah. and what if people want to be studio musicians what level do they need to be at do they need to be able to read music do they need to be able to make things up on the i mean like guitarists a lot of times yeah. they you know make up well, solos on the fly and that kind of yeah. thing that actually I'll kind of circle back to what you were saying about having um, a niche for like, oh, I'm really good at this. That's really also going to factor over then and depend on who would, is going to hire you. So if, if you're a violin player, let's say, and you're going to get hired to play um, on a string quartet or something on an album, then yeah, it should be a given that you should be a very good music reader. Cause that's probably what the client's going to give you. Right. Um, they're not going to like come up with a string line for me. Um, <laughs> however, if you're your guitar player, it's not necessary probably to even be able to read <laughs> music. It's going to be more of a feel and, and, and being able to break down chord charts and all it that. It was a sure. chord chart. Yeah. Um, but as far as like sheet music, that wouldn't 
even be on my radar ever for a guitar player just because i know a client's never going to put a piece of no. sheet music in front of one um but a chord chart sure um that would be i good. wondered about backup vocalists did, do they usually have their lines written out or do they just do someone nope. just play it for them like this is the harmony we're hearing oh yeah it's just playing it for them okay so usually when i have a background vocalist come in i it depends on who it is just um but if uh it's someone I haven't brought in before. I'll always have the harmonies sung out or somewhat, you know, roughed out for them just to hear it. Um, and be like, this is what we're going for, just in a much better, vo <laughs> much better voice <laughs> type thing. Yes. And start with that. And then if uh, if we are looking for other ideas, then we'll ask and stuff for that. But well, with the background vocal, we'll always start with what we're thinking ahead of time and just have them do that first and then kind of go from there. But that usually... There's no like written out notes or anything. There's the lyric sheet and then we'll play the melody for them and they'll figure it out, hopefully. Well, that's really good to know for anybody that's listening or watching that's interested in getting into becoming a studio musician. And of course, you know, there's these local studios like I'm talking to Travis about right now. There's also a lot of online opportunities nowadays, places like Sound Better, places like Air Gigs, where you can connect with a lot of people that have either home studios or they just like to work digitally and you know you can you can make some income that way as well do you ever work digitally there or do you just because you've no, got all the equipment as, you may as well have them there you know i do like to have them here but as you were saying that <laughs> i yeah. just i have hired two singers off the internet before mm. um recently actually mostly because the client that i had every single person that i brought in he was just not like their yeah. tone. So I went on a search online to uh, find someone that had somewhat their tone. And we did that all digitally. But like I said, that was a very specific client. And we were looking for a, a person that I just didn't have on my uh, Rolodex of people that I could bring in on, on the spot. So that was a, you know, it's a unique situation, but it did happen. So Interesting. That, yeah. yeah. And I, I find too, if like, if, if you're looking for either a unique instrument or a specialized instrument, you know, maybe you just don't have any brass players that you bring in very often, but this person sure. really wants a French horn or something on their yeah. song. Yep. 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 And um, that that's for sure viable that if it's something very unique like that online, it'll probably be the better route, <laughs> you know, marketing your service to people to try to find someone otherwise, or being just a much larger city where there's going to be multiple, a lot more musicians, you know, that would, you know, want a French horn. If we're talking about a French horn, right. <laughs> the opportunities might be less. So um, I would uh, online would probably be the way to go. Well, this has been super interesting um, to just dig into all the studio stuff. Uh, is there anything else you want to let our audience know? Not really. I mean, I like what you're doing with the podcast and getting showing ideas to musicians to be able to actually make it a career if they want, or a, a good side hustle hobby or just whatever they're uh, liking. Um, the only thing I would tell musicians is to just keep, keep going forward and keep doing what you want to do. I mean, the music business is it can be tough, <laughs> but if, if you're doing what you want to do, then that's really all that matters. And uh, at the end of the day, so um, don't let people tell you no too much and keep moving forward. I know. I, I mean, I love that message because the thing is, you know, only a certain percentage of musicians are going to quote succeed or, you know, become like commercially huge, but what's the alternative? Are you going to stop making music? If you're right. not, you're probably not, you know, because it's in your bones. Right. So right. you know, you got to still keep producing music and enjoying the process and right. Finding then, a studio like yours where you can, you know, you can connect and, and really get a great product is still going to be important to you, whether it's commercially successful or not. Right. And that kind of goes back to sitting with the band at first and, and seeing what their goal is and what their definition of, of success is. Um, if their definition of success is, you know, being able to go out and make twice as much money on the weekend playing, you know, one show one show a month type thing but being able to bring in more money well then yeah we'll you know we'll try to lean into that then it it's kind of just goes to what you want to do and what you think 
matches up with your goals and your definition of success, really. Yeah, makes sense. Well, how can our listeners uh, connect with you online? Facebook, if you go to Catamount Recording, I pretty much will respond to every message ever. Um, or our website, there's a form there or a phone number there even. That's that's easiest. So the website's catamountrecording.com. Um, and I don't think will... I ever mentioned where you're located. Oh, yeah, we're in Iowa. Cedar Falls, Iowa. Like middle um, of the country. Middle of the country, which would be a whole other discussion of like how people in the middle of nowhere, if you're not in California, New York, or uh, Texas, or Nashville, how you can still be a, a musician and, and live. <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, maybe oh. maybe in time, that'd be a whole new rabbit hole. <laughs> yeah, I know. You don't, you don't have to go and record in Nashville, LA, or New York. There's great studios all over the country. Right. Yeah, there, there's plenty of options for people out there. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I love it. Thank you so much for all of your knowledge and experience. And I appreciate you talking with us today. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Profitable Musician Show. I would love to know your takeaways and aha moments from this episode. Leave me a comment over at ProfitableMusician.com so I can bring you more of the information, interviews, and resources that you love. Thanks to Rondi Fay, one of my Academy members, for providing the music for our podcast. You can check her out at rondifay.com. That's R-A-N-D-I-F-A-Y.com. Just remember, knowledge is power, but without implementation, it is useless. And inspiration without action is merely entertainment. But I know you're not just a dreamer, you are a doer. And I promise I'll be here every week to support you and remind you that you can be a profitable musician.